All right. Welcome everybody to December's Risk Management Risk Reduction class, where we're going to complete our discussion of uh, the uh, new and revised forms in the December forms release. The, the forms release was yesterday, so that these new forms are now in place uh, in, uh, in the zip forms, in car forms, when you get your forms. I want to go through the changes in the forms today, the ones we didn't cover uh, last month. Last month, we spent some time, in fact, all of our time discussing the buyer uh, representation and broker compensation agreement and the associated forms to that to that package of, of, of forms, if you will. And we're going to talk a little bit about one of those forms again today because it impacts uh, listing agents, whether or not, uh, you know, you're involved in a buyer broker arrangement or not. As a listing agent, you may receive offers from uh, buyers who have a buyer broker agreement with their agent. And uh, uh, we reviewed it a little bit last month, but it's pretty important. I want to review it again, make sure you are uh, up to speed on it. And I want to make one general comment. We're going to do a class in January and review all these forms again and talk a little bit about buyer brokerage. That is the wave of the future, folks. The, uh, the uh, MLSs and the associations of realtors are going to gradually move uh, to a uh, to, to two policies which are going to impact buyers agents and one policy is total transparency with the buyer on what the buyer's agent is being paid right now that could be argued in fact Carr is saying it's an ethics issue uh, it's not yet a legal issue there's no law that requires you to tell uh, the buyer how much compensation you're getting as their agent. But there is an ethics rule that has already been interpreted to require that. And that is uh, uh, you have to disclose all profits that you make from any transaction. So, of course, listing agents disclose what they're getting paid by virtue of the listing contract. Uh, buyers who do not have buyer brokerage agreements are still in effect uh, participating in the payment to the buyer's agent by virtue of the sale price of the home includes the buyer's agent's commission. So that total transparency is right now a, uh, a uh, requirement to follow the code of ethics. So CAR does say that we should be disclosing to our buyer clients the commissions were being paid. And I won't review the form, but I'll remind you of it. It's called the ABCD uh, form. Uh, that is one way to do it. You can also do it by providing MLS copies that have your compensation, the, B, the CBB or the uh, BA commission uh, in it. Uh, that's uh, one wave that's coming. The other wave that's coming is uh, since buyers, since the Department of Justice believes, and I don't think they're wrong, that ultimately buyers pay the, the commission, not the sellers, because the sellers build it into the price. So it's true. It comes from the seller side of the transaction, but the seller has priced their home knowing they're paying commissions and have taken that into account. And so, you know, uh, Department of Justice, I believe, correctly rules. That's a buyer expense. And because it's a buyer expense, it should be negotiable. What does that mean? In the future, the probability is that a buyer will be able to say to a seller, not only can I buy your house, but how much you should pay my agent. I don't think buyers are going to say, pay my agent 10% because it's going to impact the price. My fear is they're going to say, pay my agent $500. You know, I mean, that's an extreme, but if you don't have a relationship with your buyer or even a buyer broker agreement, you could be caught in that problem. So buyer brokerage is, a, is the wave of the future. I think if you're going to work with buyers, you don't have to lose many, too much sleep right now. And if you're going to retire in the next couple of years, it probably won't impact you. Uh, too much, but uh, younger agents, you should uh, you should want to master 
how to present buyer broker agreements and sell your services to the buyer, just like listing agents have learned to sell their services to seller beyond I can put your home in the MLS. You know, that that's no longer a plus anymore because guess what? The seller doesn't need that anymore. They can put it on the internet. So uh, listing agents have learned how to sell their value. Uh, buyer's agents are going to need to do the same thing. Okay, so we will, we will go into that in a little more detail, review those forms next month. The, today's class is going to, with the one exception of the one buyer broker form that does impact listing agents as well, uh, we're going to review other forms and changes to the RPA. So let me jump right into my presentation. We sent out a, Lindsay sent out for me the handout, and I marked up the handout. I put little arrows in the margin, the left-hand margin, where uh, uh, the, the topic we're going to talk about uh, is highlighted so you don't have to scan the whole form. And so you can kind of follow along if you have that handout. Let me let me open my screen. And let's see. Am I sharing? Is it people see my screen now? Yes. Okay. Let me open up my PowerPoint. And there we go. Okay. So as always, don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, best way to contact me is with that direct dial. It rings right at my desk and you don't have to go through uh, the receptionist or try to figure out how to leave a 1001 uh, extension message. So call me. And that's the best number to use during business hours because I don't monitor my cell phone closely. Uh, during uh, business hours. I do monitor it more than I ever did before because Mike, as many of you know, <laughs> likes to use cell phones. And so that's how he calls me. And I pay attention to my cell phone to see if Mike's calling you and uh, calling me rather. And once in a while, I see that some of you are calling me too. So I will respond. Uh, emailing is always good. Sometimes alerting me and sending me the documents you want to discuss is helpful. I'm very visual and so we can talk about the forms when you email them to me when when you call me and then finally weekends and and uh, evenings uh best to text myself i don't always have the ringer on uh, i don't like to disturb my wife when she's uh, sleeping or napping and and uh, so i usually leave the ringer off but i keep the phone near me all the time so if you text me it lights my phone up and then i will call you back right away I believe if you're working, I should be available. So don't feel shy to call me evenings and weekends because I'm happy to, to be available to help you. All right, new and revised form, the December uh, release, which was, re these forms were released uh, yesterday. So these forms are now part of uh, your library. So let's talk about the RPA and associated forms first. And the first, uh, you know, let's look at the RPA. And the first thing I wanna talk about, no big deal, but they modified the uh, uh, financing clauses, E1 and E2, to make it possible to put in uh, the points that a buyer might uh, be willing to pay to get their loan. The old uh, contract, uh, it had zero points as a default, but that was unrealistic. Most loans, or many loans, maybe that's a better way to say it, do include points. And so uh, buyers uh, are, are willing to pay those points and you can put those points in, in the contract. I will say, and it's interesting, Carr had a discussion about this. Uh, the best practices is for buyer's agents to fill out E1. And if there's a additional financing, fill out E2. Uh, it's common practice that it's not being done. There's not been a lot of problems because it wasn't done, but it's not a good idea to just simply ignore that. I would recommend you fill that in, uh, but I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over it if you're not doing it now. Okay, the, the thing that I mentioned earlier, and that's, I want to bring this to your attention, and that's the next thing on our list here, and that's 3G3. Uh, that's a completely new clause in the RPA, and if checked, the uh, buyer is asking the seller to pay any additional compensation to the buyer's broker that the seller is not already paying as a result of it being in the MLS. And so if, in fact, you check box three, then uh, 
three things should be true. And if they're not true, don't bother checking box three as buyer's agents. The first thing is you have to have a buyer broker agreement. So if you don't have a buyer broker agreement, then then uh, 3G3 does not apply, period. Uh, so don't bother checking it. The second thing that has to apply is the CBB or the BA commission in the CRMLS. In other words, the commission that the listing agent is paying you as the buyer's agent is less than the commission that the buyer is obligated to pay you on the uh, buyer broker agreement, the BRBC. So in English, what does that mean? If the seller, if the MLS says they're paying you 3% and your buyer broker agreement says you're pay, you're, the buyer is obligated to pay you 3%, then there's no additional payment necessary and it doesn't apply. Uh, the, the buyer broker agreement, you know, just for point of clarification, states that from the obligation the buyer has to pay to the buyer's agent, you deduct anything the buyer's agent is receiving from another source, i.e. the uh, compensation in the MLS. So if I have a buyer who signed a buyer broker agreement, excuse me, and he's agreed to pay me 3%, and the... Uh, MLS says I get 3%. I don't get 6% because from the 3% the buyer has agreed to pay me, I deduct the 3% the MLS uh, is paying me or the listing agent through the MLS is paying me. I end up with zero. So, so point one, you have to have a buyer broker agreement. Point two, the CBB is less than what the buyer is obligated to pay you as the buyer's agent. And then the third point is the buyer wants the seller to pay that difference. I mean, a buyer could say, no, no, I'll make up the difference. Uh, the buyer broker might modify the agreement to reduce it to the amount that's in the uh, MLS. Uh, but uh, if there is a, a shortfall and the buyer is going to owe additional compensation by checking this box, he can ask the seller to pay that for him. It's a buyer closing cost and the seller would pay it. If, if, if the seller agreed to it. Now you attach form SPBB. See, now as a listing agent, it's important to look at this clause on the purchase contract because as a listing agent, you could get an offer from a buyer's agent who has a broker compensation agreement with his buyer and he's the buyer's agreed to pay 3% and you're only offering 2% in the MLS and they're checking this box at the seller is going to make up that one percent and if you don't catch it you've just increased the seller's uh, closing costs because the seller has agreed to pay that one percent difference that the buyer would have paid absent an agreement of the seller to pay so the first thing you want to do as a listing agent is make sure that this box is not checked and if it is Make sure that you review the SPBB. The SPBB is the seller's payment of buyer broker. That is supposed to be attached when this is uh, box is checked. So let's look at that. And the, I want to look at the first three uh, clauses because that's what a listing agent uh, wants to pay close attention to. And the first statement is the buyer has entered into a buyer broker agreement, which calls for uh, a certain amount, either a percent of the set purchase price or a dollar amount to be paid to the buyer broker by the buyer. That's one, and I made that point. Two is, as of this date, the buyer broker uh, document pursuant to the MLS, the seller's broker has agreed to pay the buyer's broker a different percentage is, is the probability. Otherwise, you don't need this form. If it's 3% and 3%, there's no difference, there's no payment. But if the buyer broker agreement was, oops, was 3% and the listing MLS is 2% to the buyer broker, well, you would put in the 2% here. And then paragraph three is 
from the three percent of paragraph one you subtract the two percent of paragraph one of paragraph two and that difference which would be one percent which goes in this box is what the seller is agreeing to pay if he doesn't counter this out so hopefully everybody understands that. If you have a question, Lindsay's going to monitor the chat. Feel free at the end here. I think we'll get through this in, in plenty of time. Uh, we'll take questions and I can go over this again. But this is a little bit beyond just being a buyer broker. This is also being a seller who may be impacted by a buyer broker's agreement that their buyer has with their buyer's agent, with the buyer's agent. Okay. We'll zip through the rest of this. Back to the RPA. So the next thing I want to talk about is contingencies. Now, if this, I discovered this. I don't know if I'm the one that alerted. I did alert Carr about it, but I think several people did. When Carr created all these contingencies, one of the contingencies, uh, the additional or, or, or itemized these contingencies, I'm sorry, let me re re rephrase that. When Carr itemized these contingencies as separate contingencies, uh, one of the things they separated out in the new contract was the review of seller documents. In the old RPA, the review of seller documents was part of the investigation of property contingency and that was in paragraph 12. they didn't change paragraph 12 when they first put out this new rpa and so it caused some problems so they've corrected that so let me review this a little bit so you know what the heck i'm talking about uh, the uh, rpa identifies as you can see here's the list eight specified contingencies and some of these contingencies are very broad, like, for example, the investigation of the property. That's a very broad contingency. But it also specifies things like reviewing seller documents. One could say that that's an investigation of the property because the seller is providing some documents about the property, i.e. the TDS. Another contingency is the preliminary report. One could say that's part of the investigation of the property because that tells you the, the, the form of title you're going to get, what kind of easements you have, whether or not you, you know, own that driveway or that driveway is part of an easement and you share it with a neighbor. That would be in the title report. Uh, the common interest disclosures, the so-called uh, HOA documents, that would be part of the investigation of the property. Uh, so... So these contingencies are itemized and identified. So of the contingencies, two through seven could be considered investigation of property contingencies. So what they did is, uh, what Carr did is in paragraph 12, they clarified that the removal of the, the investigation of property contingency does not remove the other itemized contingencies. So when I remove the investigation of property contingency, maybe I do that in the 10th day, I have 17 days to remove the review of seller documents, I still have that contingency. Hope that makes sense. Now, as a listing agent, Buyer's agents have, you know, I've helped several buyer's agents sort of take advantage of listing agents not understanding this. So as a listing agent, if you intend to have all of the buyer uh, investigation of property contingencies removed, you want to add to them things like preliminary title report, uh, 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 review of seller documents, you know, maybe a better way to say it is all contingencies except loan and appraisal contingency, you know, uh, all contingencies except COP contingency. So just be aware that if you just say on your counter, uh, buyer's physical inspection contingency to be removed in 10 days. Well, that's just one contingency. That is not all those other ones. So, so keep that in mind as you, uh, as you review with your seller, you know, what contingencies you really want removed. Hopefully that is clear. Okay. The next thing, and, and this is, this has been a problem in the past. It doesn't come up 
frequently, but it can be very serious when it does. And Carr has finally addressed this much better uh, than uh, uh, than in the past. Uh, you know, agents are now uh, more aware of this, or will be, as a result of changes to the RPA. Civil code defines any adult who lives in the property that is not an owner as a tenant. Now, many tenants are there with rental agreements. You know, so an adult lives in my house and he's a tenant, of course he is. I rented in the house, I have a, a lease. Okay, but what about an adult living in a property that has not signed any kind of a rental agreement, not paying any rent? Well, they're not tenants, are they? Yes, they are. And they have all of the rights of a so-called typical tenant who is paying rent. I'll give you where it's come up more than once in the past. A girlfriend or boyfriend living in the house with the owner. Now, normally, if everything's going well and everybody's lovey-dovey, when the boyfriend moves out, the girlfriend moves out with him. Or when the girlfriend moves out, the boyfriend moves out. But believe it or not, if something can go wrong, it will. That's the corollary to Murphy's Law, by the way, the real estate corollary. If something can go wrong in real estate, it will go wrong. We've had owners move out and their boyfriend or girlfriend refuse to move out. Why? Because they have a fight with their boyfriend or girlfriend. And they don't care, you know. Boyfriend doesn't care. Girlfriend doesn't care. They move out. They're, they're moving on with their life. And you don't live, you don't own that house anywhere. You need to get out. Well, yeah, you do, but you need to be evicted because you're a tenant by consent. So hopefully I, I haven't rambled on and confused you. Anyone other than the seller who's living in that property, you need to check tenant occupied property. It might not be rented to them, but they are a tenant. And you would want to then attach the topa. Why is that important? You've got somebody living in the house with the seller who is not on title and they're an adult, doesn't count for children. You want the TOP uh, A because it says, if I can't get that person out, my only obligation to you is your cost for the appraisal and the physical inspection. Absent this clause, 1B2, the seller could be in a world of hurt. We've had serious problems uh, because agents believed they weren't tenants because they didn't have a rental agreement. You don't need a rental agreement to be a tenant. Uh, if you're living in there, you know, you know, if you're squatting, you're living there, you know, you broke in and moved in, that's a different situation. But if you were allowed to move in, you became a tenant by consent, you know, or the boyfriend or the girlfriend did. So you would attach the topa, uh, even though the boyfriend and girl, you know, boyfriend's, you know, the girlfriend owns the house and the boyfriend's going to move out with her. Everybody's lovey-dovey. You still attach this because things change. If it can go wrong, it will. Keep that in mind. So I'll attach this. Hopefully it won't, won't matter. Now, the seller must disclose to the buyer if any if the property is occupied by tenants or persons other than the seller, and then of course attach the topa. So we, uh, uh, you know, want the buyer to be informed that by you know by the way I'm I'm living with uh, someone who is not on this title, and so therefore uh, you become aware of it, and now you want to add a topa to the agreement. And of course, you can also check where well, you should check this box here that TOPA is a part of the agreement in paragraph four. And it goes on to explain this even further in occupancy in paragraph seven. The seller shall disclose within three days to the buyer if any of the persons other than the seller are living in the house. So the seller, the buyer can find out quickly, oh my gosh, well, hopefully the two of you stay in a good relationship, but I uh, uh, want to make plans that maybe they don't move out like they're supposed to. All right, next. Not a big deal here. The home warranty, uh, they modified uh, this slightly to make it clear that the home warranty plan can include whatever is itemized. 
but the buyer is free to buy additional coverage that uh, if they want. And of course, uh, the seller is only obligated to pay the amount specified. And then that's further detailed in uh, uh, paragraph 10C1 that the home warranty option, the buyer may choose optional coverage, but if it's beyond what the seller is obligated to pay, then it would be at the buyer's cost. Okay. Uh, two items that have been added to the items included and excluded from the sale. One's kind of a big deal. We've had problems with this. Uh, the other uh, kind of amazing, I'm not sure people would leave the curtains, but take the curtain rods. I'm not sure how that works. Uh, but uh, uh, curtain rods and the hardware are also stay with the property. And so does a pool heater. Uh, We've actually had people remove the pool heater because they're expensive heaters and they want to put them on the new uh, the house they're buying uh, that doesn't have a pool heater. Uh, you know, that's really, you shouldn't be doing that. That's part of real property. And they made it clear here, the pool heater is part of the real property. Okay. A big plus in the, this new form release is a much more detail about solar systems. There is a lot of... Uh, misunderstanding about the uh, the nature of ownership of solar systems. It gets worked out in escrow. That's the good news, but it sometimes delays uh, escrow because we got to, you know, sort through all this stuff. And so Carr is sort of addressing it up front and providing much more information to the buyer and the seller about uh, selling property that have solar systems on them. So if the property has a solar system on it, then you should attach, uh, uh, if the buyer doesn't make it part of the offer, then you should attach it to your counter offer. And that's uh, the, the solar form. And I'll go through, that's a new form. And I'll go through that real quickly with you. Uh, it's pretty straightforward. But the, what I want to start with is at the beginning, the first, it's a two-page form. The first page is an advisory uh, kind of form. It just tells the buyer a lot about solar systems. And then the second page, we'll look at that in a minute, is sort of like a TDS form. It answer, it asks the seller lots of questions, what their knowledge is about their solar system. And then that information can be provided to the buyer. The thing that I like, uh, uh, I don't think it's in this paragraph. I think it's in the next paragraph. The way the seller owns the solar system, there are multiple ways solar systems can be owned. And here's what I can tell you. Having been involved in many, many, many uh, problems in sorting out the solar system as a part of the transaction, it starts with many sellers, not all, not most, but many, un unbelievably large number, have no clue as to the nature of the ownership of their solar system. They incorrectly believe they own it when in fact they may not. They incorrectly believe that there's no money owed on it still when in fact that's not true. Uh, and so just because the seller says, oh yeah, I own that system, you want to be sure you review the title report and look for uh, uh, any reference to solar systems on the title report or any reference to hero or pace liens. An owner can own a solar system outright. Uh, my son put solar on his house and he wrote a check. Uh, and he owns it. It's done. There's nothing filed with anybody. It's part of the real property. It's on his house. There's nothing, you know, he's got a warranty. That's about the only paperwork he's got. Uh, but a lot of times people finance the solar system and financing can be done in a number of different ways. And there may be UCC1 uh, liens against the property to secure the interest of the person who loaned the money on the solar system to uh, protect their interest in their loan for the solar system. A UCC1 uh, lien does not lien the entire property, but it in fact has sort of the effect of doing that because title companies won't uh, you know, issue a title report 
without clearing that, or a title of policy rather, without clearing that, or that uh, lien being uh, assumed by the new buyer. So there can be those sorts of filings that they also occur with leased solar systems. Leased solar systems, uh, they're still owned by the uh, owner of the solar system and they're being of the, of the solar equipment, uh, and then they're being leased to the owner of the house. And so the owner of the solar system, the so-called solar company, will file a UCC1 filing. Likewise, for power production contracts, power production contracts, there's no uh, no inference whatsoever that the seller owns that solar system. That solar system is owned by the company that puts it on there. And there's a contract where the seller agrees to buy their electricity from that solar system. They would also file a UCC1 uh, lien against the property. There are properties, of course, that have hero and pace liens on them, which means that those systems are being paid for through property taxes. So there's a lot of different ways that solar ownership can exist. They talk about that here further. They talk about power purchase agreements. They make the point, like I said, that the seller may not really be aware of you know, the nature of their ownership. And so the buyer needs to investigate that. And as the buyer's agent, you should be looking at the, t the preliminary title and, and looking for any reference to solar stuff. Click on all those links until you find one that doesn't make sense to you. Uh, it might be a paste lien or you find one that has some reference to a solar system on it. Uh, also, it talks about the fact that anything in the MLS or in advertising about the solar system is not part of the contract. MLS uh, information and, and advertising flyers, brochures are not contractual. So just because it's in the MLS doesn't mean it's part of the contract. And then it talks about the, you know, uh, utilizing the purchase contract itself and, and, and the transfer of the uh system to the new buyer. Uh, and finally, it talks about the buyer should evaluate all of this information, do their own research, you know, talk to professionals, talk to the solar company that has equipment on that house, and not to, oops, I'm sorry, not to rely on agents because we are not uh, uh, solar specialists. So that's uh, that's a nice a nice page one. And then page two, like I said, has a series of questions that the seller asks, and they're very similar to TDS. Are you aware of? And you have to answer it because you don't know which you, you I mean, you can't not know what you know. So you might not know, which means you're not aware of it. So then it would be no. You know, I don't know. Uh uh some of the answers to these questions. I don't know how old my system is. I find that kind of hard to believe, but you might not. So are you aware of the age of the system? No, I'm not. So you can check no, um, but you know, you got to check something. As a series of questions, you'll go through the form when you're involved in a transaction with solar, look, for, you know, make sure this is part of the uh, uh, transaction documents and, uh, and make sure that the seller has completed this information for you. And of course, the seller and the buyer sign it. All right, back to the RPA. Uh, another change, not a big, huge deal, but assignment or nomination. They add added nomination. Legally, they're different. But in the CAR RPA, they are treated the same. And so whether you say uh, it's an assignment or, you know, assignee, I have an assignee, I want to assign this to, or I want to nominate somebody uh, to take over this contract, uh, and here's my nomination, uh, it doesn't matter, it's assignment. Uh, the seller has to uh, reasonably approve any assignment request uh, within the first 17 days, or it, it can be changed, you know, during the contingency period. After 17 days, the seller can refuse uh, the assignment. We've talked about that in the past. So it's important to uh, to make that assignment request early on. There's the information regarding that. And then finally, at the, on the RPA, page 16, they've added a little more information to, again, make delivery a little easier, a little, you know, to document delivery. So they've added where the uh, listing agent and the buyer's agent, the buyer's agent first, because this is up from the RPA, and then the seller's agent uh, can add 
their contact information, address, email address, uh, phone number, and then check which one of these or all can they, uh, will they be willing to accept delivery to? And so that is, uh, uh, can be memorialized now in the RPA. And, and remember, delivery is now when it's sent. It's no longer when it's received. So that uh, that this becomes pretty important uh, in, in both directions. Sellers want the buyer's agent's information so they can get notices. And buyers want sellers' information so that they can respond to notices. Uh, and so it's, you know, neither party benefits by trying to hide uh, this information and make it difficult to send notices and to confirm receipt of notices. Uh, that that just doesn't play well in, in a transaction. Okay. Uh, and so here it is in detail. I mean, I blew it up a little bit so you could see it and you can check the box, you know, the electron, you know, designate electronic delivery can be email. It can be text if that's a, a cell phone, if there's an alternate way, uh, you know, then check the boxes that apply. And that's for both the buyer's agent and the seller's agent. All right, let's move on. We're making great progress here. That's good. I want to talk about a few other forms. Uh, there's one new form and a small handful of modified forms, nothing huge. Uh, so let's just go through them, though, and you'll be familiar with them. The first form is the non-contingent offer advisory. That's a new form. It's an advisory form that buyer's agents want to give to buyers who are making non-contingent offers. In the past, since we didn't have this form, I taught that you could use the market conditions advisory, and there are specific paragraphs that talk about contingencies and the importance of, of investigating certain aspects of the property. This form does it the same thing in a very nice one-page document. And so it talks about market conditions. It talks about non-contingent offers and the and uh, and the risks associated with it. They itemize uh, the the three major contingencies and the loan contingency, the appraisal contingency, the investigation contingency. And it discusses why you might want to preserve those contingencies and what you know having those contingencies will do for you and what you give up if you don't have those contingencies. And then finally, it has a broker recommendation section, which basically says in general, we don't recommend writing non-contingent offers. If you're you know you're planning to you know to buy this property non-contingent, there's a risk in that. And so this is a good form. Be sure to use that anytime a buyer you this is not as prevalent as it was six months ago, but even today a hot property could come on the market, lots of multiple off, you know, lots of offers coming in. And a buyer might say, well, let's make our offer non-contingent. You would want to be sure to use this form if your buyer is writing a non-contingent offer. Okay, the seller counteroffer, the seller's multiple counteroffer, and the buyer's counteroffer have been modified in one fundamental area. And that is in, par in the terms paragraph uh, 1B uh, and 1C. Unless other, uh, otherwise altered in another uh, counteroffer, the down payment and loan amounts will be adjusted in the same proportion as the original offer. So what does that mean in English? If I'm writing a, a $1 million offer and I'm putting 20% down, that's a $20,000 down payment. If they counter it's a million one, then my down payment's gonna go up uh, $10,000 and my loan's gonna go up proportionally. So loans and down payments are a percentage of the final purchase price. <clears throat> they start out as a percentage of the original purchase price, and that percentage carries through. I'm not telling you anything you didn't know. That's really not the problem. The problem, and it's interesting, Barb came to me yesterday 
And she says, this happens a lot. And I told her, well, what a coincidence. I'm going to be talking about it today. Uh, and that is in paragraph C. In paragraph C, unless, again, it's otherwise changed, if the original offer has an appraisal contingency that is lower than the original offered price, that dollar amount, that appraisal gap, carries forward if the offer is, you know, is countered up. The percentage does not carry forward. So if my appraisal gap is 10% of the purchase, but is in fact, a hundred thousand dollars it's not going to be 10 percent of, of the offer i'm sorry it's not going to be 10 percent of the final offer of a million five hundred thousand it's still going to be that hundred thousand dollar amount so the appraisal gap does not adjust that's basically what this is saying uh the appraisal gap is a firm fixed dollar amount you know, does that make sense? Well, if, if you have a question, ask me about it. This does seem to be confusing to a lot of people. And I, I hope I've made it pretty simple. Whatever the dollar amount of that appraisal gap is, that is the amount, period. You know, I'll pay 10,000 more than it appraises for, uh, period. Not, not a percentage more. Okay. Extension of time amendment. Uh, amendments and addendums, we use them interchangeable, interchangeably, but there's been some litigation recently that is sort of brought to the surface that they really are not, those terms are really not interchangeable. An amendment alters an existing agreement. An addendum clarifies an existing agreement. It's not, one could argue, and, and we believed it kind of casually, we're clarifying it, you know, we're kind of changing it and hopefully that's clear and we're doing it in an amendment uh an addendum, addendum addendum rather but technically we should be doing it in amendments we should be issuing amendments escrow does amendments they amend the escrow instructions if they're going to change them uh they they've understood this better than agents have for a long time so they change the escrow uh, the extension of time addendum to an extension of time amendment and there's an attempt to change uh, the deadline. Uh, so it's not, you know, we're not clarifying what the de deadline is, we're changing it. So that becomes sort of an offer, if you will. We're asking, uh, we're making an offer to, this, to the other party to uh, please change the deadline. Uh, it's a proposal to amend the purchase agreement. And you know, there's a list of the of the things you can change: extension of close of escrow, extension of contingencies, other extensions. You list those, and then uh, all offers uh, have to have an expiration date. An offer cannot be forever. I'll buy your house. You know, a year from now, you come to me and say, "Okay, you got to buy my house." You said you'd buy my house. No, no, no. I don't have to buy it. My offer expired. You know, nine months ago. So. This offer it has an expiration date. So when you make an, a request for an extension of time, you want to grant them at least three days to respond. You know, it's practical. If it's practical, you know, maybe five days at the most. And and then I didn't put this in the bottom of the form, but then uh, the buyer and the seller are agreeing to it when they sign uh, the uh, the amendment. So they've changed the addendum and made it more correctly an amendment. All right, cancellation of contract. They've clarified a few issues with this. I want to take you through that. We got a little bit of time, so I want to walk you through that because there still is quite a few uh, times agents are challenged a little bit on uh, how do we cancel this deal uh, or a seller wants to respond to a buyer's cancellation? Uh, how should we respond? So let me walk you through that a little bit. So the first change is up there at the bottom of this screen. It's uh, right above uh, paragraph uh, one of the cancellation. And it discusses the fact that the uh, cancellation is unilateral. It can be bilateral, but it doesn't have to be bilateral. A buyer can cancel or a seller can cancel. Both do not have to cancel. So paragraph 1A 
is is uh, and and I don't uh, you know it's either the buyer or the seller canceling. They remove that mutual cancellation. They put it down here because if it really is mutual, then there are other thoughts that go along with that. A lot of times the buyer wants to cancel and they check mutual and the seller says, I ain't agreeing to canceling. What's this? What's this? So they removed that and they made it clear that either party can cancel. Now, anybody can cancel a contract. You know, it's sort of like robbing a bank. They can't rob a bank. Yeah, they can get a gun if they, you know, if they really want to, you know, works better if you got a gun, I suppose, uh, and rob the bank. Can you get away with it? Probably not. See, so seller wants to cancel. Well, I'm sorry, nobody's defaulted. You don't get to just change your mind. You don't have that contingency. Or the buyer wants to cancel. Well, you you know, you 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 you're gonna be liable for damages because you removed all your contingencies. So I guess you can cancel. No court forces a buyer to buy a house, but they do award damages to a seller if the buyer doesn't. So one party can cancel. Uh, can they prevail in the cancellation? That would be subject to mediation and litigation if it got that far. Uh, often that's what I get involved in is trying to resolve. One party wants to cancel and the other party doesn't. Well, let's see if we can't figure this out. And then there's a bunch of think boxes to check if you are canceling the contract. So the first thing, it's either the buyer or the seller are canceling. And it's permitted by the good faith exercise of paragraph and I like this form in the sense that it's not a good idea to give the specific reason. Many of you know this. Many of you have called me and told me that you understood that. You wanted to be sure you didn't have to tell them it's because you don't like the neighbors. You don't want to say that. But the fact is they've checked out the neighborhood and they don't like them. No, you don't really say you don't like the neighbors. You say it's a good faith exercise of paragraph, whatever. And you know what I say all the time is cite the paragraph that gives you the right to cancel. And that's what you put in there, a paragraph out of the agreement. And the form kind of leads you to that nicely. Or, you know, or the buyers fail to remove contingencies uh, after being given a notice, or the seller has failed to remove a contingency after being given a notice, or the other party has failed to close escrow after being given a demand. Uh, there is an other and call me before you put something in there unless it's pretty straightforward. Now, the change is if it is going to be both people canceling, then it's a proposed mutual cancellation. And then they discuss, you know, how that will be effective. And they even discuss the fact that it can be revoked uh, if, if uh, one party wants to revoke this agreement to mutually cancel. So that's the change there. Now, the bottom half of the form does require two signatures. That does require an agreement. By the way, only one signature on the top half of the form. I didn't, I didn't put that on the screen. The bottom half of the form talks about canceling escrow you know, and what to do with the deposit. Seller authorizes the release of the buyer's deposit to the buyer. Or the buyer authorizes the release of the buyer's deposit to the seller. Now, sometimes the buyer wants to keep the deposit, the seller wants the deposit. In cases where the seller is maybe entitled to the deposit, you can negotiate, look, the buyer will uh, let the seller keep some of the deposit. I've been successful in the past where I've gotten a portion of the deposit back to the buyer because the seller was willing to keep part of the deposit. And so if that's the case, you would check that and how much of it uh, uh, you would authorize to give the seller, the balance would go back to the buyer. Now, finally, there's a box on the next page. There is no deposit in escrow. Uh, you check that box. And then the, there's a partial release and reservation of rights clause. And that is, if in fact, they want the escrow holder to hold the deposit uh, and we'll figure out what to do with it later, uh, or if there's no deposit in escrow, uh, that with a uh, partial release because, and I don't think too many of you do it, but uh, every once in a while I come upon an agent who thinks they can game the system a little bit by uh, writing a non-contingent offer uh, and then doing their inspection within the first day 
And then if they don't like their inspection, then simply not put the deposit in escrow. There have been lawsuits where the seller has gone after the buyer for that deposit, even though it wasn't an escrow. So that is not a good policy. I wouldn't recommend doing that. Folks, I believe that completes the uh, uh, class today. So we have a few minutes. We have time for our raffle. But before we do that, Lindsay, do we have any questions? Yes, we do. So uh, Vicki Barnes know, uh, wants to know if she represents a seller and the commission is more to the buyer from the seller, do we counter this out? We represent the seller and the seller is more to the seller than to the buyer? I think she might have missed a word, but it says if I represent a seller and the commission is more to the buyer from the seller, do we counter this out? Well, okay, no, here's it's, let me let me see if I can clarify that because because I the, the 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 way the question's phrased makes me believe that there is a misunderstanding. And by the way, that misunderstanding, I'm on a call with brokers with Car Legal every other week. I've told all of you about this many times. You'd be amazed at how many brokers don't understand this. Oh, well, well, I'm sorry. I'm here. That that okay. was mis misunderstood. No, I get it. So okay. if I represent the seller and the buyer's agent has a buyer broker agreement where the buyer is to pay the, the agent 3%, but in MLS, for example, I have it listed at 2.5%. So they include that form, but obviously the seller would have to pay more commission. I'm just wondering how we counter that out. Oh, okay. No, that's a good question. So so the buyer broker agreement says, uh, I get 3%, Mr. Buyer, if I help you buy a house. You're buying a house with 2% two, with or 2.5%. Two and so the buyer is going to owe me a half a percent, but let's just ask the seller to pay it. So they check exactly. that box and they give you the uh, SPBB, but you don't want to pay that difference. No, buyer agent uh, or buyer, rather, you pay that difference as a part of your closing cost, which is OK. Uh, yeah, you would counter that out. You would simply counter out that uh, paragraph uh, uh, 3G3 shall not apply. Perfect. That's okay. Yeah. Perfect. All right. All right. Okay. Right. Awesome. All right. Very good. What I was going to say, just make this clear. Keep in mind, nobody is altering the commission the seller pays as a result of the listing contract. See, that was a lot of the misconfusion. You know, the, you know, all the brokers are saying, wait, 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 you can't do this because Code of Ethics says you can't use a contract to change the commission. That's not being changed. What's being changed is, or what's being allowed for is the seller can make up the buyer's obligation to their own agent. But the commission in the in the MLS is not being changed. So that if there's any question about that, put something in the chat or raise your hand and I'll, I'll I thought that's where you were going, uh, Vicky, but no, you got that. You had a good question about how to get rid of it. Okay. Maria Lindsay. wants to know what timeline constitutes being a tenant not on the lease. Is it more than 12 months? A tenant not on the lease. I don't understand that. A tenant is a tenant by virtue of the fact. Now, there is a timeline, and that is somebody who is there uh, uh, temporarily. Like, you know, I have in-laws, and they come visit me, and they move in and live with me for a week. Well, they're not tenants. Uh, but if well, they're there permanently, they're tenants. My question that I was asking, Walt, was, yeah. so you mentioned, say, there's a boyfriend, girlfriend that lives with somebody, they're not on the lease, um, but yet then they are considered a tenant. Do they have to be there a minimum of like 12 months before they have those rights? No, they have those rights the day they moved in. Now, the 12 okay. months would be, can you give them a 30-day notice or a 60-day notice? Okay. That would be where, how long have you been there? Okay. If the, a tenant, think about it this way. Here's what, here's where agents get confused and, and, and everybody does, believe me. Uh, they put payment of rent related to tenancy and it's not. Payment of rent is not part of, it's part of a tenancy. Yeah, your payment of rent is zero, lucky you. So think about it this way. When you rent your property to somebody, on commencing January 1, and they move in on January 1. Are they a tenant on January 2? Of course they are. All right. 
Somebody moves in in January 1. They're not paying any rent. They're the boyfriend or the girlfriend. Mm-hmm. And they move in. Are they, uh, are they a tenant? Yes, they are. They just don't pay. They're a tenant by consent. Because mm-hmm. probably most tenants by consent, most boyfriends and girlfriends, mo- most, you know, it also comes up, I use boyfriend and girlfriend as an example. It's also children. It's amazing. I mean, I feel very blessed. And if you have issues with your children, I, my heart goes out to you. Uh, it's amazing how many children are in houses they won't get out because mom and dad want to sell the house, but they can't get their adult child out of the house. The adult child has been living there for two years, never paid a dime's worth of rent, and now I want to sell it, and he or she won't move out. That, that comes up almost as often as boyfriend, girlfriend won't move out. Wow. Hopefully I answered your question, Maria. Thank hey, you. Walt. Okay. Walt? Yes. It's Libby. Um, yeah. <clears throat> along with that, if, the, if, if there is a tenancy agreement with the son, say, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and his girlfriend moves in, shouldn't they, that girlfriend be added to the tenancy agreement? She and that should. would solve some problems? Right, she should. I mean, I don't want to get into the weeds here too much, but there's two issues there when that happens. If you've got a lease or a month-to-month agreement, then the person you have the agreement with, if they are bringing somebody in and creating a tenancy, the, 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 the written agreement you have has boilerplate in it where you have to be a, a notified and theoretically you have to approve that. So right. if they bring somebody in and they don't do that, that doesn't diminish the tenants, uh, the person who moves in rights, but it gives you an avenue to go after the tenant you have the lease with for your damages because they let somebody move in and didn't tell you about it. Yeah. So, okay. yeah. Um, Ingrid wants to know, do you think sellers will offer as zero dollars to the cooperating agent? If so, would the lender be able to add the 3% commission as part of the buyer's loan? Or would the buyer have to come up with this extra amount at closing? Well, that's a great question, by the way. And there's been a lot of discussion on this uh, infamous car legal conference call I get on. And they've talked about that. Right now, there are areas where uh, they're offering $1 commission. And that's because the MLS's program doesn't allow zero. It requires a a number to be put in. And so the discussion is, it isn't hard to change a program. And so I can't answer that question definitively, what's going to happen or not happen. But yeah, it's conceivable that the seller could say zero because right now in many locations, like I said, they're saying $1. Now, the other side of the coin is how are lenders going to handle this? And that's exactly, that's a very insightful question. I, my hat's off to you there. If I wore one or take it off uh, because these brokers have asked, you know, you know, would lenders allow that to be part of a loan? Would they add that to the, you know, and the consensus is probably not. That would probably be a buyer closing cost, and uh, but that that has been discussed. By the way, if you come upon this, then call me right away because it it has happened. And knock on wood, I've never lost. Lenders will tend to say, "Well, buyers can't pay commission." Yeah, they can, uh, and so lenders will at first blush disallow. In fact, uh, disallow a. Uh, uh, a seller not paying a commission and a buyer paying his own commission and disallow that as a, a closing cost to be put on the CD. And I've successfully gotten past that. It's not that hard, quite frankly, but mm-hmm. but the lender pushes back kind of hard. Why? Because it's to them uncommon. It's going to get more common going forward. Uh, Vicki yeah. Barnold wants to know, will the solar advisory be exempt with exempt sellers like a successor trustee? I just had this wherein the successor trustee provided the info, although it was difficult to get. Well, the solar advisory is not a statutory uh, disclosure. So it's not a question of whether an exempt uh, seller is uh, uh, not required to provide it. There is a general statute, of course, that any material facts you're aware of, you have to disclose no matter who you are. So I would argue that you want to try to use the solar uh, 
advisory, the uh, the solar form on every transaction as solar panels. And like I said, a trustee is go is going to know what they don't know. You know, they're going to know I don't know that, so they're going to say no to everything. And then, as a buyer's agent in that same transaction, I'd point out, look, these people don't know because they're the trustee. They inherit, you know, they're they're liquidating this. You know, the you know the the, the parents passed away, and they don't know anything about this property. So don't take no as like a, 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 an affirmative statement. No, there is none. It's I'm not aware of one. Of course, you're not. You don't you know you don't know anything about this house. But I'd still do it. The short answer is, yeah, I'd still do it okay, and well, encourage well, your. Can, you know, can I ask you one thing? Would you advise when I represent a seller that they fill out this solar advisory and questionnaire? I have a listing right now with solar and they're very vague about it because I just found out it's a power purchase agreement. Right. But would you advise that? Oh, absolutely. Okay. I would make it part of, you know, I'd make it early on in the listing contract so you're aware of it so you can provide it. Oh, yeah, that's the whole idea of the form. So you I'll to get this information with sellers. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, Kim wants to know, what if the solar company is no longer in business? Well, I mean, you disclose that. You still answer the question to the best of your ability, but add somewhere in there, you know, to your knowledge, the solar company is out of business. That could be problematic. <laughs> uh, Jeff asks, so how does the seller protect against a person that claims to be living in the home? For example, does the person claiming to be living in the seller's property have to prove they have been living there, like a mail delivery? Well, it's kind of a case by case question. I mean, I mean, if they're living there, they're living there. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, if they're a resident of that property, and you know, and they say they're a resident, and you said, "No, you're not. You're the next door neighbor. What are you doing?" You know, "No, you're not. You just came there last night. Now you don't want to leave." I suppose we would deal with that specifically, but I, I guess the answer: Do they have to prove they're a tenant? Well, you know, the seller's going to. Well, this is really more where it's going to come up is where the seller says, "Oh yeah, yeah, my son lives there, but that's okay. He's not a tenant." Yeah, he is. <laughs> he just doesn't pay rent, you know, uh, and he has rights. That's the problem. So if you have somebody that claims they're a tenant, but the seller says no, I mean, my question would be, well, what do you break in? I mean, how do you get in the house? <laughs> so, you know, case by case, we would look at that, Jeff, and figure out whether or not this person is, a, you know, for example, a squatter. No, this doesn't apply to a squatter. Uh, so. If they were a squatter, then we would document that and proceed accordingly. And then his second question is, do you use the non-contingent offer form even if you're only removing one of the contingencies? For example, just removing the loan contingency. Oh, I think I would. It's abundance of precaution and maybe circle that. Again, this is not when you're removing contingencies. This is not having the contingency in the first place. So if you are writing a, an, a, an offer that you, you're going to get a loan, but the purchase is not contingent on the loan, I would probably still provide this form and, and just highlight that on the form. It's an advisory, by the way. It is not a contract document between principles. So you give it to your client, you mark it up a little bit, you know, you like I said, you circle the loan contingency. You know, I know you got the inspection contingency, and um, but you should probably think about this with the loan contingency. You need a loan, but you're going to write it without a loan contingency. And those are all the questions in the chat. Well, well, thank all of you very much for your participation. And then let's jump into our uh, raffle. I'm going to stop the recording real quick.